Um, good evening. I'm Phil Warner. I am a glider pilot of, I don't know, 40 years, nearly 35 years probably, uh, flying at Swindon Cranfield and then for the last 25 years at Dunstable. Um, owned quite a lot of gliders over that time, Ollie 2B, Skylark 3, uh, two ASW20s, a Discus K21 shares this is in, and a Dua Discus Turbo. But I said since about two years ago, I don't own a glider anymore. I'm afraid I've gone to the dark side and own a share in a Jadel based at Enstone, um, which I also fly. I also have a radio operator's certificate of competence to work the air ground station at Enstone. But I do not have any professional weather forecasting qualification. So everything that I'm going to talk about is self-taught. I see there are some people I would consider more expert in the audience. Um, I won't be offended if you think I'm not going to learn anything from this bloke and go away. I won't be offended either if you ask me some questions at the end and I'll do my best to answer them. Um, I'm going to talk then for about 40 minutes about weather forecasting. Um, uh, yeah, I can see some conversation going on there. That's fine. I'm going to talk about weather forecasting. Um, then I'm going to stop and give you about 20 minutes for questions. And my aim is to finish up so that anyone can go and clap on their doorstep for the NHS if they want to. Um, I will be doing that anyway, but I don't have to close the session until near up half past eight. So I can come back and answer some questions if anyone's still going there. Right, let's have a look at the first slide then. I hope you can see the first slide. Um, and um, that's a picture of me walking around Dunstable, taken by a guy called Pete Stammel some years ago. And uh, he thought it was really funny because we did both get soaked shortly after that and we didn't really need a weather forecaster at that point. We could see what was going to happen and it was indeed going to rain. So we're going to do a bit of, about weather forecasting. Um, and I can see I clicked on the wrong slide, so I'm going to try and sort that on the overview slide. We're going to talk about spotting a good day ahead. How do you do that efficiently uh, without wasting too much time? We're going to track that good day down to a day which is good. We're going to talk about how I approach forecasting on the day. And then we're going to do a little bit on is the day developing as expected? I've also put a fairly light-hearted survey up on here just to get a view of how you all do your self-forecasting, really. Don't take it too seriously. It's got some questions, which some answers which some of you might find insulting, like I lay in bed for as long as possible, look to see if the sun's shining, go out and rig my glider. Um, it's a light-hearted thing. It's just something else that you can do. So that's what we're going to cover. Um, if I now... I'm just moving myself up here. Uh, so... Let's get slide three. Uh, where do we start? Um, well, I start still with synoptic charts. Um, I still think they're the best way to look at uh, what sort of days in prospect. I'm sure you're familiar with them. Got a lot of information on. Here's a synoptic chart from not very long ago, um, earlier this month. I think the 8th of April, something like that. Situation was one that we've had so a lot of the time this month. Um, we've got um, high pressure just off to the east of the UK. It's either been off to the east or northeast for quite a while now. With a easterly flow, no, that's wrong. Yeah, with an easterly flow over much of the UK, uh, probably a westerly flow over the northern part of the UK and Scotland. A quasi-stationary front rotating around itself here up in up where the where the cold turns to the warm front and um it was a pretty reasonable day but probably not a spectacular one we weren't flying anyway um let's have a look at a couple of other days here's a day that looks a bit different i'm sure you're familiar with these here's a day with low pressure more in charge the highs receded out to the east we've got some messy fronts that are trying to invade from the west and we've got a trough line situated from the midlands down to sort of southern england m4 corridor which probably produced some showers on the day and ooh, i'm still getting used to this technology 
and here's another day. I think this is Easter Monday, which is quite a reasonable day. Again, a bit breezy, quite a lot of circulation. Again, an easterly around this high pressure that's now centred just off to the northwest of Scotland, with a cold front receding to the south, leaving quite a good polar air mass here and potentially giving us quite a reasonable day. So why do I start with synoptic charts? Well, OK, I still think they're the best way to get a grab on the day ahead. They're updated fairly frequently, and I'm uh, sure you're aware from UK Met Office here, they're available at midnight, a midday for quite a number of days ahead, about five, and then closer in there's a six o'clock uh, morning and evening chart published as well. Um, they not only show you why the day is likely to be good, um, be, but they also show you what might go wrong with it. Is there a front lurking just out to the west? Um, is there a, is there a, is there something that's going to make the day go wrong? Basically, is it going to be windier than I thought? Um, so they give you pressure, wind strength, uh, and direction. Really, see where the flow is. Uh, they give you front troughs, where they're moving and how fast they're moving, and they give you, I still think, the best picture from which to pick a day ahead. They have limitations. Um, some of those limitations are they don't tell you anything about temperature. Um, they don't tell you anything about moisture dew point, so you can't judge things like cloud base from them. They're based largely the way we get them anyway in the UK on one model, uh, which is from the UK Med Office, and lots of people use those charts. Those of you that top, use Top Meteo, they still use the UK uh, model and the Med Office model. And the data is only available five days ahead. That's not really a limitation in my view. Um, I don't really believe that you need to go any further than five days ahead when you're thinking about forecasting and looking at what's going to happen. Um, there are other things you can look at for a general picture. There are forecasts from the NOAA at what's happening at 500 odd hectopascals in the atmosphere that give you a pretty good look, view of, you know, where jet streams are going to be, what the temperature is going to be probably because where the air is coming in from. But for an ordinary club pilot, I don't think you need that detail. Um, so let's move on to another slide. Why can't I move the slide counter up? I can't manage to do so. OK, what else is out there that's available fairly cheaply? When I'm out in the field or I want a very quick look at the weather, um, I use uh, Weather Pro. I call it my quick and dirty app. It's not very expensive. I don't have the premium version runs on a mobile phone, runs on tablets and mobile phones broadly. And it gives you some information the synoptic chart doesn't about the day. It tells you uh, what the max temperature is likely to be, how the temperature is going to change hour by hour through the day for five days ahead. It tells you relative humidity, so you can say something about where cloud base is likely to be. It gives you the weather for any lo location worldwide, literally. Um, and it's driven largely off the GFS. It's from the Meteo Weather Group. So it does give you information from largely a different source. It is a harmony of sources, but it's pretty much reflective of the GFS. Uh, any of you not familiar with models? Very quickly, I'm sure you are. GFS is the general forecasting system or service from the NOAA in the United States. So um, it's an alternative system. So it gives you a first pass at whether the models are are agreeing. Here's um, here's a little bit more about it. I guess this slide set will be available on the webinar site afterwards. I'm sure so many of you use it. So um, that doesn't do what I'm expecting it to do, but that does. So waiting for the slide to load. So something else that you want to pick up when you're looking for a good day, in my view, is do various different models agree? Uh, I'll mention the source a bit later where you can look at quite a lot of models. Um, if you look at the synoptic chart and an app like Weather Pro or RASP, which is free, I'll come back to that, three and a half days ahead, let's say, you should see that they pretty much agree about what sort of good day is coming up. If the synoptics are showing a good day, it should be fairly similar on other models. If they don't, there's probably disagreement just to um, give you something else to look at. I've shown some different models disagreeing here on the slide. Um, and uh, that 
probably needs to be watched. What generally happens is that by the day before the models have come together, most of them are predicting something similar. Um, so they nearly always do. Um, if they don't agree, and there are mornings when you'll come up and forecast and they still don't, then forecasting is more tricky because you've really just got to think about what else you know about the weather to try and figure out what is actually going to happen. Um, what sort of things don't they agree over? Um, well, sometimes they, they totally disagree on what the actual picture on the day is going to be, but particularly difficult to forecast days where things like thunderstorms are going to break out. Um, you'll often find that the where the thunderstorms break out and when are probably not predicted in a similar way between the models. If you're a weekend flyer, something that used to work for me, um, if you've got people with other calls on your life, um, try not to commit to a particular day um, too early um, if others have a call on your time. Um, You've got to pick between Saturday and Sunday. And by Thursday evening, I used to reckon, when I was married, which I haven't been for many years, I reckon, you know, I used to let my wife know how I thought the weekend was going to pay out as a glider pilot by Thursday evening. I used to keep a guessing a bit up to then. Um, so um, Thursday, uh, Thursday evenings are um, a pretty good time to choose which day you're going to be around. If you've got a plump for one and they both look good, they'll probably swap over between Thursday and Saturday, but you'll still get a reasonable day out of it. So if you can keep the weekend days open until a Thursday evening, that's a good thing to do. I'm going back a slide, which I don't want to do. Ignore that. OK, so let's look at some days we spotted coming up from days I just happened to have on file. This was a very good day. This was the 21st of June 2018. We were flying the Dunstable Regionals then, which is um, why I have, and I was forecasting it, I wasn't actually flying the comp, I gave up doing that about 2015. Um, I was forecasting it, and therefore I got pictures from that day. And you can see that these two pictures, one for the 30th of July, no, that's wrong, one for the, I'm on the wrong set, one I think for the 18th of June here, and one on the day, on the 21st, not a lot is changing. We could see this day coming. The general picture looks the same. Over the three or so days between the two pictures, you can see the day's got, if anything, better. It looked like two or three days ahead, wind was going to be quite strong and from the north. We'd had awful weather before um, this day. It had been very wet associated with this fairly slow moving, as I remember, cold front here. But what actually happened was pressure built in a little bit higher here. The wind was a bit less than forecast. It wasn't particularly strong on the day because the high had built in better the cold front had ceased being a surface vent feature through here and the whole thing had moved out further to the east so the day actually improved between two or three days ahead and on the day um, if i go to the next slide this is uh the 9th of july 2017 this was shennington and this, I think, was the Friday or Saturday synoptic chart, probably the Friday synoptic chart in reality, maybe late Friday, the one we used in the Saturday briefing on that day to say what tomorrow would be like. For any of you who've flown the Shennington comp, they tend to have a fairly wild party on the Saturday night by gliding comp standards. And um, I thought we probably wouldn't fly. Um, you could see this. I mean, this isn't going to be like this. We always know this. When we see a right angle in a front like this, I never really believe the day is on the day it will look like that. But you can see this feature here, which is a sort of complex front, um, some rotation in it here, probably going to stay with us around the middle of the day and wipe out flying. Um, so if you're weather forecaster on a, on a day on a comp like that, you just get people all evening coming up and say, hey, Phil, I'll buy you a pint. I'll buy you a pint. What's, we're not going to be flying tomorrow, are you? Um, are we? And um, and I never say never. Um, I will, would did say on that night, I think it's quite unlikely, but if it all goes wrong, I'm going to get the blame. So I went no further than I think it's quite unlikely, given the synoptic chart I've just looked at. What actually happened, we got a high here. We sort of built in a little bit through here. The front ended up staying to the west of us um, as a feature. And we tasked our gliders on a fairly short task out to the northeast and then down to the south and back from Shennington. And we did get a day out of it. 
it wasn't spectacular i ended up going to fetch someone in the afternoon so this is a day that's got better become usable and has only done so within about 24 hours of the period before similarly days can go to worms here is monday the 1st of august 2016 i'm still using black and white photographs at this stage or synoptics never look brilliant but you can imagine that there's some ridging through here in the channel pressure's not too low down here um, you've got a depression way out to the west it's only just coming into ireland it's still in the southwest approaches at midday so you can imagine we might be able to go flying and this is from um, the 30th of july looking at the 1st of august and if we probably going to load the wrong slide now give me a minute if we go to the actual day here's the synoptic chart that was available in the morning for midday on that day and you can see this whole thing has speeded up there's a warm front here that isn't a surface feature notice that the um, little blobs on it are not filled in and Phil, the day is in fact sorry, on to stop you. sorry to stop you Yep. Can you enable your mouse pointer? Enable your mouse pointer, please. See what you're pointing. See what you're pointing at. Okay. How do I do that? Um, on the bottom um, menu. On the bottom menu. Yeah. Okay. That. The third button the from third the left. Button from the arrow. Left. Yeah. An arrow. If you press that. You press that. Press winter. Press winter. Yeah. Has that got it? Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. You can see that this um, this front's moved in here more, and we're now looking at a situation where the day has gone to worms. So. Synoptic charts are the quickest way, I think, backed up with something like an app to spot a, a good day ahead. I'm assuming that, you know, you're not a guy who's going to spend ages in front of your computer. You've got other things to be doing, but you just want a look at it. And that's that's how I do that. So let's move on a bit. OK, so that's spotting the day ahead. Doesn't take too long, does it? Uh, just a couple of quick looks a couple of times a day and you're keeping a fair idea on how things are going. So when you spot a good day, keep tracking things based on at least two models. You don't need a subscription tool to do this. Um, I, at this stage, probably actually only use them as cross-check. I do do a little bit more, but I can get away with using them as a cross-check. And for detail, OK, you're not going to see things like top cover, potentially. You're not going to see things like that by looking at the synoptic chart, but your mobile phone app will give you a, a bit of a go guide on that. Um, It'll say things like hazy sunshine. Um, look for changes in the synoptic charts, either in a negative or a positive way, right up to the day. Often a good day will go to worms. It seems to happen more often than um, it seems to happen more often um, than than not. Um, but sometimes a wormy day will come good, and if you just keep looking at it, that's how I do it. So there we are. Our good day's held up. It's like the 21st of June, which we're going to look at in more detail in a minute. It's held up well and it's got to the day. OK, so what do we do on the day? We first of all, we get up. OK, tongue in cheek, he says, no matter who's lying next to you, get yourself out of bed and see whether God's delivered the present that you were hoping for the night before. For me, it's a bit like Christmas Day, really. I still get a buzz out of doing this. I've always been the kind of guy I'll go and pull the curtain back as soon as it's light just to see what sort of day we're going to get. And today you do need to be a bit more of a detective and check a range of things to try and assess the day. And what you're really doing, and what I do particularly when I am forecasting comps, is to build a story. I've got all this stuff on slides on my app, on my, on my PC, but I want to sit down now and think, what's this day going to look like at 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock and 7 o'clock? What's the sky going to look like through the day? Um, and where, what's it going to look like in different parts of the country? Um, it's not always easy. You still get up on the morning sometimes and there's conflicting information. There was one day, I can't remember which, at the Shennington Regionals last year, where I really was struggling for a story. I just couldn't see what the day was going to do okay so what i do first is i am a bit old-fashioned but i'll look at synoptic and i'll look like the, look at things like metars and tafs from airfields that's uh, met uh, actuals and tafs they are available from a number of sources um and just have a look at some numbers i'm not really ready to do interpretation yet my brain's not working enough so i can just and i still have a pad 
just get down some numbers. I can get down temperatures, dew points, pressures, wind directions, strengths from the TAF probably. Is the wind going to change majorly through the day? Um, you know, across the period of the TAF for an airfield, it will tell you that. And this first pass will often tell you whether the day is living up to its expectations. And sometimes from that, i.e. the front's come in more quickly, it was going to be over Ireland when I went to bed last night, it's now going to be over Bath in the middle of the day, you don't need to do any more. You can go back to that person you were lying next to, and she or she will be delighted. Um, a little story to tell here. Um, this wasn't someone I was living with at the time, they lived about 15 miles away, but they were a very good friend of mine, and it got me a little expression that stuck. It was Good Friday about 10, 15 years ago. And I did just this. I went and looked. And because I told this person that I was going to go flying on Good Friday, so I'll probably see you some other time over the weekend. But there I realised the day's gone to worms. So up at nine, I'm phoning her up and saying, oh, well, uh, it's Good Friday. I was going to go flying, but it doesn't look too good now. So I've got some one or two pretty dry looking, but probably OK, frozen hot cross buns in the uh, in the freezer. I'll tell you what, I'll take them out and come over and uh, I'll have a cup of tea with you. And that got me a label now, which I always get because I often phone this friend up on a day that's gone to worms of bad fly day boy. You could use it for bad fly day girl as well. Um, if you've got a close friend, you may they may want to inherit that expression when you continually phone them up and insist on their company because now you've got nothing better to do because the weather's gone to worms. So look as much information as you can afford afford if you don't have the money for subscription apps you can still do a pretty good job of forecasting it's just going to take you a bit longer um, so having looked at those uh, digital pieces of information and the synoptic the next thing i probably look at is the sat pick is it as i expect it to look not much cloud about hopefully if it's going to be a good soaring day no great gobs of cloud I'm not expect expecting. If it's a wave day you're looking for, I'm not going to talk in detail. I'm really talking about thermal soaring, not wave. But if it's a wave day, you might want to see some clouds with that typical sort of rib formation that gives away that there's wave about. You can go to the Met Office, um, have a look at their, some data there for free. You can use RASP, which I still really, really like. I still really like RASP. I still use it a lot. I use... Uh, soundings, model and actuals if they're available, but I don't get bogged down in them. I can do the putting of the temperature on the line, drawing the line, deciding where cloud base is going to be, thinking about what cloud tops are going to be. I can do all that, but I pretty much rely on the models to do that these days. Um, I'll come back to actual soundings in a minute. You can get soundings from RASP now for any location if you know the Latin long. And Windy um, is another source of information and that has its own useful things. Um, you can most of the time, as I say, come up with a good enough forecast from these without paying a subscription, but be prepared for it to take you a little bit longer. Paging down now to the next of my slides. Uh, okay, let's just have a look at RASP. I'm sure most of you are familiar with it. Here's a RASP picture with cloud base. Um, this is earlier this week or last week, and you can see this is a day when we've got quite a lot of easterly wind, so the east coast is getting completely sea breezed out or cold north sea aired out and the best parts in the west and you can see there were reasonable cloud bases on this day it's typically a color presentation um, it can give you um, i'm going to go back a slide i think it can give you lots of things if you press the full parameter set button on rasp you can get an awful lot of information thermal strength and height it can give you cupid potential, will it be blue, give you overdevelopment, give you temperature dew point, surface wind, convergence, give you model soundings. Uh, it is GFS driven, like a lot of the stuff that we can access. Um, so it is largely driven by one model crunching the data. And it's not as detailed as if you do pay the money for some of the paid for subscriptions acts, you can get pretty detailed forecasts for quite a small area of the UK. And you can fine tune things and see the effect of ridges and so on and so forth, particularly on SkySight. Isn't as detailed as that, but it's still a pretty good tool considering it doesn't cost you any money. Here we go now to Windy. This gives you wind information for a location. Um, in this case Dunstable, through the day, but also if you put a location into the search box, you'll get a picture of the day in fairly crude terms, but quite a lot of useful information. And the good thing here is you can do a comparison of the models. It's got a number of models. It's got the European model. It's got Meteo Blue, which I think is French. It's got the Icon model, which is what I happen to be showing here. 
it's got the GFS model, which is um, the NOAA model, and I think it's got a NEMS model, which is a surface modified NOAA model as well. So you can flick through the models and take a look, and this is again free. There is a subscription to Windy. I don't know what it gives you. I don't subscribe to it. Um, I just use the free version. And it gives you an idea of whether everybody thinks the weather's going to be the same and a pick up on what the differences between the models are. If it's a straightforward day, you won't need to do this. If it's a less straightforward day, you might be grappling for that story and you might then need to um, you might then need to uh, uh, take a look at the models and they might help you resolve what the hell is going to happen. Is it still worth listening to the radio or watching TV? Yep, I still do it. Typically, I have the radio on in the background, but I know lots of people who watch TV. Here's Laura from the ITV um, morning situation. Um, quite a few things they can do, and the BBC particularly good at this. If it's going to be a day where clouds are going to um, move in, they can give you the progress of that cloud, the direction, how much of it they expect to develop, um, what speed they think it's going to move at. Um, that's you know something that quick and easily gives you information and it's information that's been derived relatively recently they have their useful phrases which are meant for the general public but still derived from information so sunny spells as it says here that means to me that it's not going to be sunny all today all day long if it was they would say something like wall-to-wall -wall sunshine which is another one they like um, cloud will bubble up and there will be less sunshine in the afternoon is a giveaway for spread out or um, you know something like that so I still use the public forecast sorry my computer's making some unwarranted noises there so I still take a look at one of those in the morning if you want to pay more then there's sky Stike, top meteo the med office paid for subscription you pay your money and take your choice. If we were flying now and I were forecasting, I would have a subscription to SkySight. I haven't renewed it if Matt's watching at the moment. I will renew it as soon as we start going flying again and I'm doing forecasting for people. Um, it's simply that it's run out. Um, I do have a Top Meteo subscription. Um, if we're flying by June, I'll renew that one too. Um, the Met Office have a subscription service and it depends what you want. Um, each has their strengths and weaknesses. I probably would go for SkySight now. I think it's probably got a lot of things that make it very easy for an average glider pilot to interpret what's going on. It's visual. You can plot a task on it and figure, and it will figure out how what speed you're going to be able to fly that task today or how long it's going to take you to fly the task. Um, it's got things like that, which are really useful tools. Um, we'll just have a look at some pictures. Both give you a potential flying distance. I'm going to say something about that in a minute. Here's a top meteo presentation uh, for a day in the past, probably a day when a front was coming in from the west. Uh, not particularly spectacular soaring days. Many of you will be familiar, but top meteo gives you these uh, potential thermal heights. It's not particularly strong on giving you thermal strength, but it does give you potential thermal sites, uh, heights in this case in hundreds of meters. Um, it gives you whether the day is going to be blue or not. There are lots of things you can click on, like cloud. This is um, uh, thermals in the top meteo presentation. You can click on wind direction, for example. You've got the synoptic chart. You've got your TAFs and metars there all in one place. It gives a visualization of rain out here. Um, I still like top meteo. It's still something I use because I'm so familiar with it. I tend to know its limitations. It has picked up that not much is going on out on the coast today on this presentation, uh, on the day that I was looking at. It doesn't always pick up coastal effects particularly well. It doesn't pick up topography as well as a uh, sky site where you can often see the effect of, say, the Cotswold edge. If you look at a sky site presentation, here's a sky site presentation. Um, I said last season when I, or season before when I started to use sky site that Top Meteo was like your older girlfriend or boyfriend. Um, it, uh, it, it um, it had a lot of information. You knew where to find everything, but you weren't quite sure it did as much as it used to for you. Whereas SkySight was a new kid on the block. Um, so this is a SkySight thermal height presentation with thermal height in feet. By the look of it down the right hand side here, and typically a visual presentation. You can see the coasts again are not good on that particular day. Um, for things like convergences and sea breezes, actually, RASP is as good as anything. It has a very good convergence picture. And both SkySight and Top Meteo try to do this. They give you a PFD, um, a potential flight distance, often for 
different types of glider over the day and they will um, they will tell you how far you're going to fly on that day um, what they do is take an integrated view of the day so they look at the thermal strength across the day and they try to integrate it into a distance you can fly in your glider shown in this sky sight presentation down the right hand side here in kilometers not a good day i've chosen i was limited on what i could actually find and uh, but it was a day i think from the aston down club class competition and it did quite nicely predict if i remember rightly on that day we did manage to test the gliders out hereford uh, and back on a day which did have a lot of shower activity and a lot else going on uh, it wasn't so good out to the east as i remember two things to say here um, don't be fooled. A long weekday may look quite good because there's thermal activity over a long period, but it's not particularly strong. That might get integrated into something that looks rather better than you're actually going to find. And also a short thermal, good strong thermal period in a day which has poor patches as well might also be presented as quite good because that short period of good weather will be integrated to give you a good uh, PFD when perhaps the PFD isn't going to be as good as you thought it might be okay I hope you're all still with me uh, all we're going to do now is look at an actual day we're going to look at the 21st of June 2018 that's the day I showed you the run up to earlier it was a very good day we were running Dunstable regionals so I was forecasting every day and still have some data for it it was visible visible for several days ahead although we were reliant on a front getting out of the way we had a very wet day the day before when we were talking about um, assigned area tasks because we intended to set a couple which we did um, and uh, it was a day when Tim Jenkinson flew from Dunstable launching very early nine-ish uh, maybe even a bit earlier than that driving out with his engine somewhere putting it away starting going way up north coming back down to somewhere in the channel and then driving back from over the channel without getting his feet wet um to to do a lot very long distance uh, tim if you're watching i'm sure you'll remember the day okay so we've seen the synoptic charts for the day here's a top meteo presentation for that day i don't know whether you can see these numbers i can't the way this presenter presentation works but it shows a good day widely a bit of bluing out a bit of weakness down here um it, that's probably in the lee of the, some downs down here but it shows the strongest lift being in East Anglia, stretching up to the northeast Midlands. Slightly weaker lift down here. And uh, if I move to the sat pick, um, here's probably some stuff trailing behind that front. I don't know. This is a sat pick at 10 past 8 in the morning, but it was looking quite good and open. There is some stuff from the Cheshire Gap here. I haven't mentioned the Cheshire Gap, but basically try not to be downwind of it. Um, the Cheshire Gap does tend to be a, a place where cloud and showers can come through. They get dried out to the east and west of it by the Welsh mountains and the Pennines, and you can get showers running right down across the country on those days when the wind is from the northwest, as it was on this, this day. And this might be a bit of Cheshire Gap effect going on uh, through here. Coming down to RASP's presentation, this was a confounding feature. This is overdevelopment as RASP presented it at two o'clock local in the afternoon. And it's showing some pretty severe overdevelopment here in East Anglia. Still some overdevelopment through here, running up here. This is obviously the northwesterly bringing sea air into North Norfolk. Um, but it was a worry on the day. How much overdevelopment were we going to see? and where therefore would we send the gliders here is a model sounding for um, lark hill at three o'clock in the afternoon and you can see that this is quite good again i don't go into soundings in great detail anymore i try just to use them because the models the, the model uh, the forecasting tools have integrated from them very very much we have a good gap between the dew point moisture line and the temperature line here that indicates there'll be good strong thermals going on down here they don't quite touch here so that means we shouldn't see an area where anything that ascends up into um, that layer is moist and we're going to get a lot of condensation and a lot of spread out this is lark hill where not much spread out was forecast again sorry if no people don't know where lark hill is it's down on the salisbury plain there's a little bit of an inversion here which will tend to arrest thermals so that might put a lid on it at about 6,000 feet here on the day 
but this gets very dry out here uh, so this is all looking really good as well you can do the old calculation stick a temperature line on stick the dew point of pressure in and extrapolate how a thermal will rise at a particular temperature uh, for you guys i honestly not sure for most of you it's actually worth the time of you doing it anymore it doesn't give you anything you can't get somewhere else what I did do on this day was cross-check it, and I don't have it any longer, with an actual Lark Hill sounding. One of the nice things about Lark Hill is because the military are far lobbing up artillery shells and they want to know how they're going to behave in the atmosphere so they don't drop on Mrs Higgins, they drop on the military target down the road when they're going to go bombing with artillery. They do send up a real sounding balloon, typically at six and about half past eight in the morning, so you can get on weekdays anyway, a real sounding, and it's some, that is something worth doing just to cross-check that the model sounding and the real sounding look something sit like similar because if they don't you might have a problem with the day okay so how was the day summarized by me light northwesterly breeze uh, 15 to 20 knots at flying height 12 on the surface q to 5000 feet but widespread spread out at its greatest in east anglia east midlands and yorkshire cloud bases lower southern central england and wales 4000 to 5000 feet Good temperature difference here of about 13 degrees should give you a 5,200 foot cloud base. I'm sure you're familiar, but basically take the difference and multiply by 400. That will give you a good idea of cloud base. Some debate, depending on the air mass, whether it's 300 or 400, but somewhere in that range. I predicted four not thermals. I tend to be conservative about thermals. And best soaring area everywhere early. Not very often you can say about that. More sun, southern central England later because we were worried about that spread out. Finished 1730, as Tim proved, it probably went on for an hour and a half at least after that. But I always forecast conservative finishes. I don't really believe anybody wants to be out there flying in weak conditions, particularly in a comp. They want to have the day in reasonable conditions. Come home, go and get a pint, get the boyfriend or girlfriend to go and polish and de-rig the glider and do it all in reasonable soaring conditions. So Matt, who's with me tonight, will know that when I forecast it for him, they always want to go later, and I always try and dissuade them from doing it. So where did the gliders go? Um, give you a couple of minutes if you want to type in where you think what sort of task you think we would have set on that day. Anybody going to type in? Where did we go? I can't see anything coming in at the moment. Maybe I need to page down from these comments because I'm not looking at the most recent comment. Uh, can I scroll down? uh matt if you're there uh, okay yeah that would have worked thank you adrian sutton bank would have worked in fact um i don't know whether robin may's on here i don't want to embarrass him too much but he got very low near sutton bank and sadly had to start his motor i probably have embarrassed him now I won't be in a tug again if he's on here um uh yeah out and return to the north would have been good uh we were looking not to get the gliders too far away at being a competition um, what we actually did was something like this. So we sent the gliders into wind up to, I think it was Beaver Castle up near Grantham. We then gave them a good downwind run here. Uh, the, the idea was to get them through any spread out that did develop here before it did anyway. But even if it was, they're running downwind. If it's starting to spread out, they can go further between the thermals down to... Uh, can't see where that is because it's too small, but it's somewhere uh, northeast of Cambridge probably or somewhere like that. And then we ran them west to Cherrington down here near Gloucester. Um, that was across the wind, but it, we did this really to protect ourselves against that spread out. Even though it wasn't so good down here, uh, from an absolute point of view we felt they'd do better because they were going to be in the sunshine and then we gave them a run back into Dunstable that worked pretty well we could have gone further north of course but for the unfortunate who does did land out we thought that might land them out away from the field so we were competition task setting and that's what we did and they all had a good day that's the red task for 429 kilometers um, private pilots obviously would have gone a lot further on that day and the blue task was, I think, 350 kilometres, 365 kilometres, maybe something like that, within that area for the little gliders. So while you're waiting to launch, is there anything you can be doing? Uh, and this is one of the main tasks for a forecaster, if I'm forecasting a day now. Um, is the day doing what it should? Um, another expression from a friend of mine, I'll sit out on the airfield 
um, and I'll say, uh, well, the day isn't really doing what it's supposed to. And some wag will say, um, well, um, uh, it's not that the day isn't doing what it's supposed to, Phil. It's that your forecast is wrong, um, which is probably true. The day is doing exactly what it's going to do. So is the temperature rising at the right point? Matt will remember day when, when we got very frustrated doing the Cup Class Nationals at AD last year, I think, where it didn't. We got a bit of top cover, and that was just enough to stop the temperature rising. We had a couple of uh, sniffers up there for hours. They stayed up, but it wasn't anything we wanted to launch 50 gliders into. Um, the Lark Hill sounding's good. Any other sounding, if you're in another part of the country, there are still some others done. Belfast often does one. Um, Hurstman so often does one. Um, just compare with the model. Just look at the picture and say, are these two pictures the same if you've got a recent sounding? And Lark Hill's particularly good because it comes up in the morning. Uh, the upper state one is usually up by about 10 o'clock. Sapic, cloud movement and development. Is the cloud coming in quicker if there's a front? Is the cloud bubbling up quicker? Is there no cloud bubbling up at all? Is it going to be blue, even though I didn't think it was going to be, or a later start? And here's my day. I've looked at all the data. Where were the flaws in it? What could possibly go wrong? Could it overdevelop? Um, could the wind be stronger than forecast and give me a problem in my glider? And then go out and fly. And, of course, you still keep looking at the sky. I used to look at it too much, I think, when I used to fly a lot of cross-country tasks. And what are you looking for? Things like overdevelopment. I wasn't expecting that. It looks like it's going a bit flat and horrible out there. It's overdeveloping. Um, what am I going to do about it? I'm going to slow down, be prepared to go off track. Same thing with showers. That cloud's beginning to look a bit angry. Oh, look, there's bits coming out. Of the bottle. Oh, there's bits in my canopy now. Um, going blue. Um, get these, these, the day is switching to a blue day. Obviously, the cumulus are just getting smaller and smaller, flatter and flatter as they bump into the inversion. Frontal clouds coming in. We're going to get an early cut off here. Um, those are the kind of things you can do when you go flying. Right, let me try and move down. I think the most important piece of advice I'd have, and I was going to have a picture of two ladies here, but I thought that would offend someone, so in the end I went for two gliders. Um, always look at the day you see before you not the day you want it to be. I see too many pilots who look at one piece of information and go, yeah, it's going to be booming, and then end up disappointed. Think of it as a couple of gliders. It has the same effect. If you fly in a Skylark 3, and that's what you've got, and that's what you can see before you, you're not going to go out and do the same as you would if it's an ASG 29. Uh, if you took the ASG-29 out of the trailer and you've got an old Skylark 3 for a bit of fun and the ASG-29 was missing something or you couldn't rig it, you're not going to do the same day. Same with the weather. If you are hoping for it to be a really good day, don't be fooled. Don't take the one piece of information. Look at what's before you. Plot that day through and work things out accordingly. And go and fly. Here's a sky we hope we all see soon and be able to go flying in if we can get rid of this wretched coronavirus there i said 40 minutes uh, so um there we are as i say the level pi i pitched that up was really for club pilots um i've given you a little questionnaire really to find out how you are doing it and how long you spend doing it and what you do do these days um that's it from me i think i might invite matt to come in and help me with questions i'm gonna get um Zero people have done the uh, survey summary yet. I haven't gone to the survey summary, but someone else might have done that. Have you done that? I don't know. Um, anyway, uh, I'm going to scroll down here to questions. Um, any questions for the next few minutes? See someone's flying Condor this year. Yeah, I... I um, I don't know what you can do in Condor. I've got a little problem with Condor, which is that I don't have a computer with a big enough video card to run the current version, um, so I don't have Condor. But does Condor allow you to set the weather? Does it allow you to... Uh, I know that Dunstable had a comp, and they flew it in mega conditions uh, over Easter. Uh, they all flew good days. Um, so um, it does, John, you're saying, yeah. And that's what I think you should be doing. You should be setting yourself why, why not set yourself the day's conditions why not try and do a forecast and go in the day's conditions because that's what you're going to be flying and you're not going to be romping around in 10 knot thermals under 5,000 foot cloud bases any other questions coming in there you can be frank have you found it useful at all what i've tried to do is just tell you what i do uh yep yeah. 
glad, glad to see some yeses there good okay and even an excellent well that's great that's good feedback i hope you've uh, i found uh, what i try to do is just put some framework in you know not so you don't go aimlessly just clicking around all morning um and uh, and um and not know what the hell happens um good okay uh, matt is still there quite a lot of thanks coming in not too many questions um how many of you i got well it's a hard question one thing yeah i see you doing the survey now just trying to find out what you do do is that matt coming in yeah i'm here yeah i'm here hi matt good okay i'm getting a few questions um thank you for not trying to sell us a subscription <laughs> there may be someone on there who is going to sell you a subscription in a minute um uh, look out the clubhouse window. Yeah, that's still a good thing to do. One thing I don't do, incidentally, is I don't look at the sky particularly first thing in the morning because often it's not a good indicator. So I get up, I'm expecting a bright sunny morning and it's the clouds nice, full of crowd and I've got a nice little ridge about two and a half K from where I live here that I can see and I can't see it. And I don't, I don't let that bother me too much. I keep looking at what all the information says. I'm a glider pilot's wife and I enjoyed it. I hope I haven't offended you, madam, with my um, slightly old-fashioned comments about de-rigging gliders and things like that. <laughs> um, good. Yeah, and you can probably do the forecasting now for, um, for your gentleman so he can go out and get his glider ready. I don't know. That's going to cause a deluge of probably adverse comment in a minute. Could you quickly repeat the cloud gas calculation using temperature and dew point? Yeah, it's quite simple. Um, take the difference between the two and multiply them by, if you want to be pessimistic, 300. If you want to be a bit optimistic, 400. And that will give you cloud base. So if it's 6, 6 times 400. Uh, no, let's take go back to my example. If it's 13, 13 times 400, well, that's 4,000. And it's 3 times, it's, um, it's, let's say, uh, 4 times um, 6, that's 24. That's 5,400 foot cloud base. She doesn't upset easily. Good. Well, she wouldn't because she's a guider pilot's wife, really. <laughs> uh, great. Um, how relevant is your Lark Hill sounding to cross-country pilots, I think? Um, I'm going to try and use a trick of publishing that one, except I can't see it at the moment. Uh, can you say something about convergence? OK, I can't seem to publish it. I'll just get on and answer it. Um, it depends. I use it quite a lot if I'm tasking into that area. If you're in southern England, obviously, it's very, very useful because it provided, well, ha, look at where the air mass is coming from. But if the air mass has stayed the same over the last few hours uh, or, or Lark Hill's upwind of you, um, then um, then obviously um, it's pretty useful because the, for the model's forecasting one thing. And although the sound is at six in the morning, if the situation is fairly stable for the day, then it can be very useful. Obviously, if you've got a front gun coming through and you're going to go soaring at one in the afternoon after the front's gone through and the front's not gone through Lark Hill yet, then it's pretty useless. How do I calculate how far to come? Can I say something about convergence? Yes, I'm not an expert on convergence. I did, I've done quite a bit of flying in them in Spain. Um, obviously, if you've got a sea breeze front coming in, um, and you've got a westerly wind, at some point those two air masses are going to meet and they'll create lift. Um, and there's a colour-coded system on RASP. If you go and look at convergence, press the full data system on RASP. It will give you an idea of what rate of climb you're going to get in that convergence. And you'll often see a line running, say, round the east coast where the sea breeze front is coming in. You'll see that line move over the day. It's in yellow on the convergence thing, if I remember rightly. And it will give you a view of how strong that convergence is going to be. Um, and someone's put RASP is very good for convergence. Yep, that's right. So with SkySight, I can remember we had a little convergence when I used to do Wednesday evening flying last season set up. I didn't know it was convergence at the time. It was just some weak lift. And I thought, what's this? I'll go back and look at SkySight. And Matt had accurately predicted that there would be convergence there. Still don't know what was causing it. It was 8 o'clock in the evening. Two air masses meeting, obviously, with nowhere to go but up. But um, I found I was under-tasking with RASP last year's previous year's fine don't have a great deal to say about that really um if it's consistently under tasking it's consistently pessimistic um what did someone say that i didn't get on uh, do i keep a score of predictions against actual yes i do and particularly when there's a competition um i'm very disappointed if i've got the day wrong um so yeah i'll, I'll see what the day's doing on the day and something i meant to mention that you can do as a glider pilot actually is go home 
and see how the day measured up against what the forecast was going to do. And that way you'll learn where the models have their imperfections. I've done that with Top Meteo quite a lot, and I can now, in the back of my mind somewhere, I've got a view of where Top Meteo has its weaknesses. Um, I'm trying to page down here. There was one I missed. Uh, I'm going to come up to it. Uh, how do I figure out how far to go on the day? Okay, well, it's something we do in competitions. I was going to do a separate little presentation maybe about forecasting for competitions, but I might not get the same audience if, if Matt's still looking for slots, maybe in a month's time if we're still in this situation. Um, basically, um, it depends on how good your pilot is and what glider you've got. Uh, those are the two variables. And what you need to do from the day, on a very good day, I suppose in a competition, I would expect good gliders with good pilots to be doing 90 to 110 kph i'd expect less good pilots in stubby gliders maybe to do 60 to 70 kph um so that would give me an idea what really affects it is the wind if you've got to send your gliders into wind remember they will go very very slowly indeed you can take that 60 kph and take the wind speed off it and get an idea of what they're going to actually achieve so on a windy day, you need if you're only going to have to do an interwind sector, you're going to have to downgrade your distances significantly. Um, just flying yourself, you'll get an idea of how far you go on on given days and get an idea of what the day is going to be and try and remember the last day that looked like the one that you did. Um, yeah. Okay, 1951. Have I got anything coming in now? Uh, under Tuscan with Rasp. Not too much. 